Do you spend hours in your head thinking about something that happened, could have happened, or might happen? Do you ask others what to do so you don't make a mistake? Welcome to the Playing It Safe podcast. I am Dr. Z, your host. I am a clinical psychologist, an author, and a person that is super passionate about sharing with you science-based skills to overcome any type of fear-based struggles. Who doesn't experience fear? Who doesn't play it safe? In this show, we will discuss how fear-based reactions happen in day-to-day life, how playing it safe behaviors look like, sound like, and feel like, how you can put into action solid tips from behavioral science to get unstuck from worries, fears, obsessions, and anxieties, and how you can start doing what works, what matters, and what you care about. Behavioral science doesn't have to be boring. Thanks for listening, and let's get started. Today, I have a special conversation to share with all of you. In this episode, you will hear an interview with Paul Ollinger. Paul is a nationally touring stand-up comedian, podcaster, and former digital sales leader. He performs at comedy clubs, festivals, and also corporate events all over the country. He is also the author of You Should Totally Get an MBA, a comedian's guide to the top U.S. business schools. Um, The reason why I was super curious to have Paul on the podcast is because Paul has a very interesting story before becoming a comedian. Um, He went to business school in Dartmouth, and then in business school, he realized that comedy was his passion. But because of things that happen in life, he pursued his passion, his values later on in life. So in this interview, you will hear how Paul navigates through that, how Paul navigates the contradiction from waking up and having a life that looked perfect on the outside to living a life that gave him meaning. I was really touched by this conversation. And to hear firsthand how Paul handled those fears of failure, fears of rejection, those fears about not being good enough, and how he made this decision to make a pivot on his career and in his life. Close to the end of the interview, you will hear Paul sharing key questions he asks himself to make a shift on his career. So if you are stuck, waking up every day and living a life that doesn't give you meaning, doesn't give you purpose, and you play it safe by going along with this life, I really hope that this episode helps you to get unstuck and to consider some questions you can start asking yourself to live a life that you want to live. Let me know what you think of this interview. I welcome any reactions or comments you have you can go to the website www.playingitsafe.zone and send me an email. And if you have a request for any other topic related to playing it safe moves, discounting what is important to us, overthinking, avoiding situations, avoiding people, please let me know because I will be happy to create some content for you. Okay, without further ado, I leave you with a conversation with Paul. Paul, thank you so much for making the time to chat with me today. Thank you for having me. A couple of months ago, I discovered your podcast, Crazy Money, Mm -hmm. and I started listening to some of the episodes. And then when I learned more about your history, it totally called my attention because I learned that you made a huge shift in your career from working on high-tech companies like Facebook, Yahoo, to becoming a comedian. So I would love to learn more about that, how it happened, how was the process? Well, I always, I had had a dream of being a comedian since I was in business school. uh, Ironically, I went to business school to make more money and I told jokes at a talent show one night and I fell in love with performing comedy and I I didn't know that was in there Mm -hmm. until I had that experience, but I experienced this wave of laughter of the audience all laughing simultaneously for an extended period of time. And I was like, oh, this, that's the drug I want to do with mm-hmm. my career. And, but I had borrowed $80,000 uh, for, for my tuition. So I had student loans that had to be paid back. 
So yeah, yeah. I went and this is in 1997. I went into the digital media business and that was my first job out of business school. Eventually I took a comedy class mm. and when I had, when I had saved enough money and paid off my student loans back in 2005, I quit mm -hmm. the corporate world and, and did comedy for two years in Los Angeles. So that was my first round with comedy. Can I unpack that a little bit? I am visualizing there that you have this job, like a perfect job on the outside, a mm -hmm. job that allows you to pay your student loans for the family, maybe just have extra vacations. But mm -hmm. then there is something happening there inside, right? That lets you to make this shift. What was that about? How did you decide to make that jump to being a comedian the first time? Every day I woke up, I thought about comedy and I had this thing and I was single at the time. So I was, uh, this is 2005 when I left, I was, I was dating my wife, but, but not mm -hmm. yet married. Uh, and so, but every day I woke up, I thought about comedy and comedy is what I thought about when I went to bed at night. And so I, I had this thing inside of me that was eating at me that said, give me a try, figure <laughs> out what's here, decide, you know, f find out what would happen if you gave this your, your full attention. And so I forwent many career opportunities that, that would have continued me going up the corporate ladder and, and then eventually left the, the, the digital world at that point mm -hmm. to, to go try to, to be a comedian in Los Angeles. And so it was, it wasn't, it wasn't that I didn't like where I worked. I really enjoyed working at Yahoo and, and had a great group of colleagues and, and lots of opportunity was there for me if I wanted it, but it wasn't as strong an appeal as, as trying to chase this comedy dream. If I can ask a little bit more about this, I hear that you like what you were doing, but there is a difference liking what we do and finding meaning, joy in what we do and finding our purpose. Well, I think sometimes your work can be your purpose because your work is providing for higher level goals like taking care of your family and and paying for school and paying your mortgage and things like that i had no dependence at the time and i had met my obligation of paying off the debts that i owed mm -hmm. so it was it wasn't it wasn't so much of a luxury that i was going to go chase my dream it was something i felt like i had to do Mm -hmm. And it, it, it wasn't that I hated my job. It just wasn't, it wasn't what I felt incredibly passionate about. And so that was an easy conversation or an easy decision to make. And mm -hmm. in fact, after two years of doing comedy in Los Angeles, the first time I got engaged and I, and I thought, well, I want to have a family. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to provide for them. And I knew what my opportunity cost was in the digital world or what I could be making in the digital world. And I went back to work when I got an offer to work at a small company called Facebook. I had no idea what, you know, it was going to turn into, mm -hmm. but I went back because I liked the people who ran the sales team. I had worked with them at Yahoo and I thought, well, this company is, is, uh, it's, it, it seems to be on its way, but I, mm -hmm. but certainly didn't have any, any concept that it was going to get as big as it got. But it looks like to make that shift, you, you ask yourself again, what's important for me? And at the time it was to provide a family and raise a family. So that was more like what I will call a values-based move, right? You figure out what's important, you make a decision. When I was looking at your bio, there is this paragraph that says, but after four years in his Facebook office, staring at a poster that asked, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's the story behind that? If we can go back to that moment. <laughs> well, that, that might be a little overly sensationalized in the bio. <laughs> but, but, but in fact, it's quite true that there were posters all over Facebook that said things like break the rules and, and done is better than perfect. And, and what would you do if you weren't afraid? And I would pass that poster by and a voice inside of me would say, if you weren't afraid, you would be doing comedy right now. If you weren't afraid, you'd be, you wouldn't be working here. And so uh, I was a little bit afraid, but uh, y you know, I, I also realized that once I was a couple of years into Facebook or even in, gosh, just a year into Facebook, I realized that this company was going to be far bigger than I had imagined and that the stock that I received was going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity to put a, a certain amount of money in the bank that was not going to come around again. 
if mm -hmm. I left to go do comedy. So I figured, well, let's put in the time. Um, let's, let's, let's get fully vested on this stock and then see what happens after that. And when did you decide to make the shift of going back to do full-time comedy? It actually wasn't, uh, Patricia, it actually wasn't as clean as it, as, as I'm, as I might portray it in a, in a very short bio. I, I left Facebook and moved back home to Atlanta. I was running the West coast sales team out of Los Angeles okay. and I moved back home to Atlanta where my parents were, uh, going to, they were, they were living nearby, but we moved them back here. They were getting older and they had some illnesses they were dealing with. And so I moved back home and I didn't immediately go into comedy again. I, I just stopped working for a few years mm -hmm. and I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And if, if I could do any of anything over again, um, I would, I, I wouldn't, I would still leave, but I would be, I'd go towards something as opposed to away from something. I was sort of frustrated with some things at Facebook and I just left and, and, uh, and, and I didn't have a plan. And mm -hmm. if I could go back in, in time, I would say, okay, take a few months off, take a break, but then dive into comedy. But I didn't know where to start. I was in Atlanta. I didn't know where to start. I didn't know. And I was afraid. I was still afraid. I was afraid of failure. I was afraid to not be accepted. And uh, after a few years of kind of treading water, I finally committed and and uh, worked my way toward uh, rebeginning uh, my, my, my comedy career in a new city. Thank you so much for sharing that, figuring out what we want to do. It's never this clean process, right? It actually can get very messy and we feel lost and we forget sometimes what's really important to us. Within that therapy approach and the model that I use, it's called acceptance and commitment skills or acceptance and commitment training. We create a bunch of exercises to help all of us to get in touch with what really gives us meaning and purpose. So sometimes in therapy or through coaching, we guide people to figure that out. At that time, after you left Facebook and there is no backup plan, we're just moving on. How did you figure out that becoming a comedian was your thing, your passion, your call? Well, I, I spent it. The first thing I realized was that just having a certain amount of money wasn't going to make life as transparently easy and meaningful as I had thought it would. I had put a lot of value on making a lot of money. And when I made it and I quit my job, I realized that after a few months of enjoying the relaxation of not having a, a quota and office politics and things like that, at a certain point you wake up and you go, well, what am I going to do today? And how does today fit into a bigger overall plan? And who am I? And all these kinds of things. And boy, I miss my friends from work who could be annoying sometimes, but they were my friends. This was my network. This is my support team, even if, you know, my, 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 my personal network of friendship and love and, and learning and all that kind of stuff. And so at a certain point, I just had to get to the, get honest and say, well, what would I do if I weren't afraid? What would I do if I could do anything, which I could at that point, because I didn't have to go work in a job that I didn't want to, to pay my, my mortgage the next month. And I said, <laughs> you know, finally, I just said, well, I'm going to wake up every morning and I'm going to write and I'm going to start going to open mics mm -hmm. in Atlanta, and I'm going to figure this scene out. And eventually I met some people and they helped show me the ropes and introduced me to who the people were in Atlanta. And that was seven years ago next month. It's incredible. Let me just unpack this a little bit. So one of the things that I am passionate about is capturing fear-based experiences. I think fear has a very poor branding. We don't talk too much about <laughs> it, right? It's really bad branding. But reality that it's part of our day-to-day -day life, right? Like every single day among the hundreds of emotions we experience, we do experience moments of fear, anxiety, stress. And I'm visualizing here, you are going to do some open mic evenings, performing there. That's really tough. You know, when you're throwing a joke and you don't know how it's going to land, and, you know, you're trying to read maybe the public. Like, if I were in your shoes, I will have some fears of performance, fears of rejection, fears of being a failure. How did you navigate through all that as you keep moving into doing what's important to you? Poorly at first. In fact, after, I think, maybe 18 months of not working, I finally went to an open mic. 
Mm-hmm. And I and I did okay. And then I went to maybe two or three more. And the last one I went to in that phase, I bombed so badly that on the way home, I started, I was like, I'm going to look for a job as soon as I get home. I went back to work for a year uh, that uh, I took a job with a company that I wasn't actually super excited about. I just sort of took a job because I needed, a, I thought I needed a job. I needed an answer to the question, what do you do every day? And I did it for a year and, you know, nine months into that year, it became really clear that there were problems at the company that I was never going to be able to fix. And uh, I knew I had to leave. And after that, I just had to be really clear with myself to say, it, it, there's nothing else I would rather do. I'm going to fail at times. I'm, I'm going to succeed at other times. And in fact, the more you fail, especially in comedy, the better off, the better you get, because you, the only way you get to do new, the only way you, you learn new material and develop new material is by taking risks and by risking that the new joke isn't going to work as it often does not. And Mm -hmm. you have to develop not just, not just the empirical thought, but the emotional attitude that I'm going to fail and it's good for me and that's okay. And that, that failing, that bombing isn't failing. Bombing mm-hmm. and failing are different things. If you don't mind, if I can go back to this moment, you are there, uh, left Facebook, doing some open mics, but you notice that I didn't handle these fears effectively. I handled them poorly. What mm-hmm. does it mean? If I will be next to you and we're not handling those fears effectively, what will I have seen you doing or saying? Well, I think there's there's different kinds of fears. The the my biggest fear, the reason I'm a comedian is the fear that on my deathbed I will regret not having ch- taken the chances that would have made my life more extraordinary than it otherwise would have been. That is the biggest fear. That that I'm not taking chances that that my heart is driving me toward that might not make sense from a logical perspective. Mm-hmm. That's a long-term fear. The short-term fear is I'm going to tell this joke in front of other comedians who are going to judge me. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to look foolish. That fear you learn to deal with. And in fact, what other comedians really judge you on, the ones that have been around a long time, is not taking chances, is doing the same material over and over and over. Mm-hmm. Not, uh, the safe material, the stuff that you know works. Yeah. That, that's, that's where among people who've been doing it for a while, they, that you earn or, or lose respect based on your willingness to keep pushing forward or not taking shortcuts or not, not using the tricks that you know work on stage and they know work. Yeah. Well. They know what you're doing. Yeah. Well, that's a plain it's safe move, right? When I only do what I know the outcome of it. That's how we just play it safe many times. But then you decide, I'm just going to do open mics. I'm going to write every single day. You realize that you need to radically accept that failing is going to be part of the process and know something that is going to kill you. How did you figure that out? How do we shift the mindset about failing? It's just, it's experience. It's, mm. it, it takes years of understanding it, and it also takes years of building confidence and building your reputation to where, you know, people know I'm good enough in, mm-hmm. in, on my local scene. They, they, they've seen me hundreds and hundreds of times mm-hmm. because I've shown up. That's, there's sort of these, these sort of levels I think you go through. The first is when people don't know who you are, like when I showed up in the Atlanta comedy scene, people are like, oh, this is some guy that just made some money at Facebook and he's now he's going to try to, he's going to come slum it with the comedians and, you know, he thinks he's funny, whatever. He took some class, who cares? And even if you do well, if they're still suspicious of you, mm-hmm. until, you until you until you keep showing up. And yeah. then you keep showing up, not month over month, but year after year. And then eventually people are like, well, I guess he's not going to go away. So we might as well, you know, invite him to be on our shows. Mm -hmm. Might as well, you know, recommend him to our friends. We might as well give him a shot as a performer and as a human being. And so when you earn 
when you earn trust, you earn the ability to take more risks because mm -hmm. people, people know you because people believe in you because they know you're a nice person in the green room and they, they know that you're not gonna, that you're going to treat them with respect also. Mm -hmm. So showing up consistently help a lot. But the part that I found very powerful, and of course, I have a biased opinion because I'm a behaviorist. Mm -hmm. I think many times when we have fears or doubts, we try to respond to all those doubts with more thinking, listing all these positive thoughts, <laughs> trying to replace them, telling me I'm good enough. There's a whole world out there that says that you can build self-confidence by thinking differently about yourself. But I think there's a huge difference when you have experiential knowledge and you try things. You go and actually put yourself out there, you sweat, you stutter, you struggle a little bit and you throw the joke, which is a little bit what you are describing, right? You decided to put yourself out there every single night. Well, I am a classical overthinker. I have oh, a yeah. <laughs> very busy brain. I have, you know, I have, I've, I've got a, a lot of voices telling me that I'm not good enough, that I'm not working hard enough and that the world isn't giving me the opportunities I deserve and that blah, 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 blah. And, and it all comes down to just, you just go do it. Go do the work. Mm -hmm. Go say the joke. The stakes are so low. They're so low. And, and the price for not trying is 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 way higher than the price of actually trying mm -hmm. so shut up and go try and fail and if you fail have a people don't respond like the audience the audience doesn't really care so much whether or not your joke lands as much as they as they care how you handle it they care about they care about are are you confident mm -hmm. are you okay whether or not you know we laugh do you know you're funny do you know you're like do you know what you're trying to get across because if you do you can just sit there and look at them and go, you guys don't have any idea how funny this is. You're just, you know, you're not paying. Like, what? And, and they won't, they might not laugh, but they're not going to lose respect for you. And that's where you, that's where you lose an audience. Not when, not when a joke doesn't work, but when mm -hmm. they can see that it bothers you that it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so you have to maintain this, like, it's going to be okay. Like what difference does it make? Mm -hmm. None of you are going to give me a sitcom today nobody's getting sitcoms today, you know? So who cares? I'm working on being that person more and more. We all carry this story that we're not good enough, right? I'm not a smart enough. I am not a good doctor. I think we have variations of that. It's part of our human experience to travel with them. If you were to give a name to the story that your mind tells you, like all the blah, 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 what name would you give to that story? What name would I give to the story? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's not a productive name. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a childish voice mm -hmm. that, that thinks very short term mm -hmm. and, and is, and is, and is very self-centered. It's not thinking about the world beyond the end of my nose. And so that voice is never productive. Um, I don't know what that name would be. Yeah, yeah. I'm just asking because in my work, I encourage people to name these stories, give it a name. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the story takes over our actions and we become puppets of them. But we can catch those voices, those stories, and sometimes be silly with them. If I can switch gears a little bit, so here you are seven years into being a full-time comedian, kudos to you and tons of respect. What is your process when you are creating these jokes and you are there standing up in front of hundreds of people and just throwing one after another one? What's the creative process behind the scenes, if I can learn a little bit about it? Well, I have an Evernote account that I, I, I have dozens and dozens of files in Evernote that are works in progress of, of bits that have anywhere from four words, like a four word prompt. And I don't know what it's going to turn into to documents that are hundreds of words long mm -hmm. that are full bits written out that I've been doing, you know, on stage for a while. Um, it's all, it's, it's trying to see how these things interrelate and what the common themes are and how do I 
arrange them in ways that help that allow me to tell a story and not bore the audience and and i'm the the challenge is in these days and times to find something to talk about without being preachy to mm -hmm. find ways to make your point and make it entertaining because there's a lot of people out there who just want to get on a soapbox and yeah. and preach about politics from one side or the other and it's almost always really boring mm -hmm. um, unless they can figure out a way to really weave in insights that are not obvious mm -hmm. and that's what that's that's where you have to that's where the the genius i think comes in is finding like what what do you have to add to this topic that isn't already being said mm -hmm. or that isn't so transparently um obvious that oh. it's not not even worth talking about yeah yeah so you collect all your ideas in this evernote document and you're checking what i can add uh, and then when you're performing how is that process these days for you well it's you know we still haven't recovered from the quarantine fully yeah. i have i in in a couple hours i have another um I have another Zoom show tonight, a live comedy Zoom show for a corporate client, which I'm glad to have. But that's not quite as uh, I have the percentage of shows that I'm doing online are far lower than they were a year ago. <laughs> you know, where I, I probably did 200 plus shows in 2019, I probably did 12 live shows in 2020. And the number is definitely up from there, but it's nowhere close to where it was pre quarantine. Some clubs aren't open fully. Some clubs are open back up, but they're not having as many shows. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been hard to reestablish relationships that I had in different towns. So, so, so getting back up to full speed is one thing, you know, writing on stage or, or the creative process on stage is I'm just trying to every set I do, do a different, bring one of those Evernote documents you know, to mind and say, let's just say it and see what happens because everything could shut down again next week. Unfortunately, that's far more likely than any of us hope, mm -hmm. but it's certainly a possibility and you might as well figure out, you know, if this material is, is, you know, how, how the, how the audiences are going to relate to the material, because if they shut down again for a few months, who knows what's going to be relevant six months from now. Mm -hmm. That's true. I think we're living in such an uncertain time. We're navigating through it to the best we can. Paul, this is a very silly question. How many jokes do you prepare for a show? Like for your show tonight, how many jokes do you prepare? Well, it's sort of, I don't really think about a joke number. It's a, it's a certain number of minutes. So tonight I'll probably do 15 minutes and uh, that will give me time to do... Uh, I'll do some crowd work. I'll make fun of the people on the call. I'll, you know, I'll talk about their industry. I will, and I serve as the role of host in this show because I'm the one who produced it and uh, I've been working with the company to bring in the other comedians. So I'll host it. And so I'll try to make everybody feel welcome, tell some jokes about them, tell some jokes about my corporate past. And then I'll do some, I'll, I'll think about like, okay, what three bits am I going to do? And each bit could last anywhere from two to five minutes. Got it, got it. I find that fascinating on the sense that it seems that you have to make decisions on the spot, right? You're performing, you are introducing stuff, and then you're making the decision, okay, what are the three beats I say? Did I get that right? Is that how it goes? Yeah, it's some combination of that. You really want to be prepared to to just, you want to be present in the, uh, on, on stage. You want to be, you want to bring the audience into it to the extent that it it enlivens the show and makes the audience feel a, a part of it up to the point where it gets distracting. Sometimes people go to comedy shows and feel like they should be the show. And that's just, that's not, that's, that's very distracting to the rest of the audience. Uh, but you have, so you have some roadmap in your head and then you try to leave, you stay flexible enough to, to uh, ad lib, do crowd work, whatever, whatever the moment calls for. Got it. And after that, do you update your Evernote file with all these ideas when you see which ones maybe have a larger reception than others? <laughs> I try to keep it as clean as possible. So if there's something I realize is never going to work, I'll delete it. But okay. there's, you know, what I find 
is that things I wrote five years ago, I'll go back into files and think like, I'm still talking and thinking about the same stuff. So obviously that's something that's stuck in my head that I need to continue to work on and continue to try out to, as we say, work it out on stage. Got it. If it's okay, let me just ask you a little bit more questions. In preparation for this interview, people had some comments about making a career change because there is a lot of fears. And, and again, that's another way in which we play it safe. We discount what's really important to us. And there is a contradiction between the life we're living and the life that we want to live. So one person replied that when considering making a career shift, the worries were about, will I be fulfilled and happy? Do I have enough of a support system? What will happen with my finances? How will it happen? What would you advise people who are considering making a career shift, but are having this, you know, roller coaster of worries? Well, there's a lot of those worries are, are justified. That, mm -hmm. that when you leave one career and go to another, you're entering a, a, a new world that is uncertain. Yeah. If you're going to try to make a living as an artist, then it's, it's highly uncertain, financially speaking, and you should be prepared for that. And it all comes back to what are you willing to sacrifice mm -hmm. to live the kind of life you want to live. And I was very fortunate that I sort of won the lottery at Facebook. and but. I also am on the same page. My wife and I are on the same page that we, we live a certain kind of a lifestyle that mm -hmm. is very nice, but there's a lot of things both of us would still like to do that cost a lot of money that we're not able to do because of the career choices that each of us has made. And mm -hmm. so there's sacrifices that come and there's uncertainty that enters the picture. Mm -hmm. I also think it's important to understand that a career change might improve your life, but it's not going to fix every problem that you have. And that putting that level of stress on a new job or a new way of living is unrealistic. Yeah. And that there's, and that there's things that you don't anticipate about, you know, I, I really love doing comedy. I, and I, and clearly it's a choice I've made, but it's a very solitary way to live. Mm -hmm. I don't have the same kind of colleagues and the same kind of work support system that I had when I worked in corporate America. I don't have the same kind of social life. I don't, uh, I don't see friends that I really love and miss who I used to work with or who I was in the same industry. And so you forego, a, you, here's, here's the thing that I always tell people. The only thing you're guaranteed of when you make a switch into living a different kind of life is the answer to the question, what would happen if I gave it my all? That's all you get. You don't, you, maybe you'll succeed. Maybe you'll be wildly successful, but that, that's not guaranteed. And it happens for only a very small percentage of people. So you really need to say the answer to that question is as important as anything that I can think of. And when you get the answer to that question, by definition, you don't get the answer to another question, which is, what would happen if I gave this other thing my all, this old corporate career? You don't get both. Yeah. And so you have to come to terms with that and say, and do everything you can to think through what is your day-to-day -day life going to look like when you're in this, when you, if, you're a, if, you're, if you go to become a small batch ice cream maker, mm -hmm. what is your day-to-day -day life going to look like? What are your stresses going to be? Who will you spend time with? How will you define success? Write it all down because you will find yourself wondering why the hell did I do this? I had a perfectly good job, safe, great benefits, predictable way to make a living. You should also write down why you're leaving because you'll forget the things that were painful that caused you to leave. And you'll only be focused on the new pain in your new situation. Even though that's what you wanted, you just have to re remember no matter what you do, there will be stress. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even if it's the right kind of stress. Yeah, I love that response. I think doing the things that are important to us, they don't come anxiety-free or stress-free. Every time we do what is important, there is going to be noise, emotional noise, thinking noise. The question is, along with what you're saying, am I willing to make room for that and still take action to do what matters? And that's a choice that we ended up doing as you did. 
we're running out of time. My gosh, I would like to unpack many more things. But I have one more question. If you were to have a cup of tea or coffee with any person you want today, who will that be and why? I should have an answer to this. Um, <laughs> who would I have a cup of tea with? Should I say Donald Trump? Should I say <laughs> I'm trying to be non-judgmental right now. Clearly, I'm having a hard time. Wouldn't that be interesting, though? I mean, wouldn't it be interesting to have a cup of tea with Donald Trump just to just to be able to see him up close? And I've been up close with Donald Trump before, but not in, not in 15 years, a long time ago. Okay. But but wouldn't it be interesting to just knowing what you know, observing what we've observed over the past six years, whatever, to sit down and be like, what is what what is with this guy? What is what like? What's happening with this cat? What what are his fears and anxieties? What happened to him when he was a kid? Would that be interesting? It, it wouldn't necessarily be fun or enjoyable. No, no. You know, I hear you saying that I'm scratching my head here. Yeah. <laughs> what that look like, right? But yeah, you know, it's really it's a really good point. How will I'm supposed to say Jesus or Martin Luther King or something like that, right? <laughs> No, no, no. All responses are valid, right? But it's a really interesting one. And so let me, if you were to be I next. I want to have a cup of tea with my high school girlfriend who broke up with me on the breezeway during lunch on November 11th, 1986. No, I'm just kidding. That's <laughs> oh my goodness. I totally let go of that. I've totally let go of that. <laughs> no. Well, would you ask Donald Trump if you were to have a chance to, yeah, have a cup of tea or a beer with him? Oh, uh, gosh. Um, I think he prefers Diet Coke. I think that's his beverage. So we'll have a Diet Coke with the former president of the United States. I don't know. I would want to know. I would, you know, you wouldn't get an honest answer. You know, you wouldn't get an honest answer. So I would want to know, what do you care about? What do you, mm -hmm. what do you really, really care about? Mm -hmm. I would be very interested to know. I, maybe he would say his children. And he might mean that. I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's hard to know. I think what we have witnessed is a lot of lack of caring in many decisions that have been made. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. I think he cares about himself more than any, than any office, than any country, than anything else. And so I would, I would really be interested to understand what he thinks he cares about. Yeah, yeah. It will be an interesting and juicy conversation, as I will say, a juicy one. <laughs> That's a juicy conversation. Yeah. Paul, thank you so much for making the time to chat with me. Very much appreciate it. And I hope I can bring you back again. Thank you, Patricia. I'd be delighted. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, I will very much appreciate it if you will subscribe and share this podcast with your friends. And if you're feeling extra generous, I welcome a review on Apple Podcasts. Show notes of this episode are in the website Playing It Safe, that's on. Make sure to subscribe to my newsletter so you can receive more tips to stop all types of unworkable Playing It Safe actions. See you soon!